Um, so serverless. That's the talk we're in. Um, who here has, uh, has been using some amount of serverless systems? OK, few of you. Who here thinks they know what serverless is? Oh, even less of you. This is going to be exciting. OK, great. <laughs> then, I've, then, I've, then, I've just, then I've got this right. So I was, I was looking at last year's um, schedule, and um, Tim Wagner, who uh, actually runs Amazon Lambda um, and API Gateway, gave a talk here, and I was like, oh, should I give like a more high-powered talk and to, to follow in Tim's footsteps? But I decided, nope, I'm going to do an intro. This stuff's all pretty new. So I think, hopefully, I, I pick the right tone. And I'm keep keeping this uh, mostly as an introduction. So uh, what if I told you that you could let other people do all your repetitive work for you, um, that you could only pay for your servers when they're actually doing something useful, and that you can make every day a hack day. Well, that's the premise of serverless, um, and it's what I'm here to talk about today. So just to start off, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the industry nearly 20 years in a whole bunch of roles, from engineering to management, um, uh, and various other things in between. Um, I started my own consulting business uh, at the beginning of this year uh, with a good friend of mine, um, specializing in, in serverless, um, because it's something that I've, I've really become very excited about in a way that I haven't done about a technology platform for a long time. Um, and so I hadn't been a consultant for over a decade, but I decided that um, this was somewhere where I wanted to jump in. Um, I used to work for a, a consulting company called ThoughtWorks back in the early mid 2000s. Um, did a lot of stuff around agile development then um, and open source as well. And then worked for a number of uh, product companies and, and finance companies over the years since then. And now, as I say, this is what I do. So how did I get to this serverless thing? Well, last, last year, I went to a conference on serverless. One of, my, one of my teams had been using it at the company I was at. And we'd been using a bunch of technology from, from Amazon uh, that I thought was really interesting. And so I decided to, to write an article um, on this subject. Uh, and my good friend Martin Fowler offered to off, uh, post it on his website. And so I wrote an article about this stuff on, on his website. Has anyone here read this thing over the last year or so? So a few of you. Um, so it turns out that Hacker News is still a thing, or was a thing. I, I didn't know it was a thing. And it was huge. And, and so this was really popular. And, and then, as if by magic, I, was, I ended up becoming a consultant on this stuff, partly because of the popularity um, of this article last year. Um, this is already out of date, because this stuff's pretty new. Uh, no, there's a little bit here that's out of date, but actually it's still mostly right. But um, I have a, a short book coming out uh, in June or so um, with my uh, uh, business partner. Uh, so look out for this. So what does this talk about? Well, we're going to talk about a few things. First of all, I'm going to tell you what is serverless. Um, then I'm going to tell you why you might be interested in serverless. I'm going to talk about a bunch of dragons. So we've got a long enough talk here that I don't have to just give you, the, uh, give you the nice things. I can talk about a few things you need to be aware of as well if you're going to start going down this road. Um, I'm going to talk about some use cases, so things where this stuff works out really well, stuff where you might not want to use this as well. And then we'll close out with, with looking at the future. And depending on how much time we've got left, we'll figure out whether we want to do a QA or possibly even a demo. Um, but this is sort of the main stuff that we want to chat about today. So first of all, what is serverless? Well, serverless at its uh, most basic uh, is the next evolution of the cloud. And so let's first of all remind ourselves of what's happened over the last decade with the cloud. So in 2006, the cloud really began in earnest because that was the year that Amazon launched Amazon Web Services. Um, and with it, EC2, uh, Elastic Compute Cloud, and S3, Simple Storage Service. Um, and this was really the start of infrastructure as a service. And with EC2, it was about how people can now rent virtual machines by the hour, as opposed to buying their own machines or sort of <coughs> renting physical machines by the month. And the benefits to this stuff uh, are that it is faster to get projects up, up and running. Um, so you have lead time of minutes rather than months for, for, for systems. 
It's cheaper uh, because you only pay for the machines that you actually need on a day-to-day -day basis and not, the, thing, not the, the machines that you thought you might have been needing when you were doing resource planning six months before. And it's also a little bit better in that you can rely on folks that are specialized in specific types of infrastructural work um, with, with skills that you might not have on your own teams to handle things like networking and machine repairs and all that kind of stuff. So that was the start of the cloud with infrastructure as a service. Now, of course, Amazon aren't the only game in town, and Microsoft uh, came along in 2010 with Azure, uh, and Google in 2011 with their cloud platform. But if we go back to 2007, this is where we see actually the next phase of the cloud. So platform as a service, um, and its champion, in, in my mind, Heroku, allow us, uh, allows us to concentrate on applications uh, and not operating systems when we're actually deploying our server-side software. Now, platform as a service can be a little bit restrictive or, or expensive, depending on what you're doing. Um, but we can gain many similar benefits of platform as a service uh, by using containerization. It can often be a little bit trickier to set up, but it gives us a lot more flexibility. And containerization techniques aren't that new, it turns out. LXC has been around in, with Linux for, for a long time, but Docker came along in 2013 um, and, and brought containerization to the masses and made it a lot easier to use this stuff. And Google have led the way in, in bringing containers to the cloud uh, with Google Container Engine. And obviously, Amazon have their own product as well, but sort of I, I see Google as, as the leader in, in this area, specifically. And that brings us up to today. So in many ways, as I said, serverless is the next evolution of the cloud in that we're continuing the path of outsourcing more infrastructural responsibility to others and the, we're gaining cost benefits and time to market advantages through that. But what is serverless more than just an evolution of the cloud? Well, it really consists of two main classes of technology. <clears throat> the first one we call backend as a service and the second one, second one we call functions as a service. And I'm going to detail what these are. So backend as, back as a service, excuse me, is uh, a little like one more as a service. Sorry, I think there's six different as a services in this talk. Um, so backend as a service is a, is, is a little like software as a service. So software as a service is, things, is, is outsourced software, like GitHub or Salesforce or Travis CI, but with software as a service, we are outsourcing actual organizational processes, whether that be um, sort of business processes or technical processes. We're outsourcing actual processes. With backend as a service, what we're doing is we're actually out doing is outsourcing actual parts of our production applications and not just processes around how we work. So I'll give you some examples. So the first one I always like to talk about um, is Google Firebase. Who here has used or uses Google Firebase? A few of you. It's, it's, a, it's actually a fairly sort of lesser known product for, for Google, considering it's Google. Um, so what Google Firebase is mostly used for is by mobile application development teams. Um, and really, backend as a service became popular uh, through mobile dev teams. They, uh, many teams a few years ago were using a product called Pars, um, which Facebook bought and have since closed down. And the idea with PARS and, and now with Google Firebase is that mobile dev teams can build a complete product without actually having to write any server-side software at all. And even the database that they use, they don't really have to do any database administration. That database in, in Firebase, in this, in this example, is really set up with mobile applications in mind. So it does a lot of that administration work for you. And the security around it is set up for that environment. So that's one example of a, of a backend as a service. Another example is something like Auth0. Anyone here used Auth0 at all? So, a few of you. So, <laughs> who here, when they've ever worked on a project, has ever written code or been involved with code that's all about user login and user management and user sign up? Well, okay, most of us. Uh, keep your hands up. Put your hand down if, if you've only ever done that once and, sorry, keep your hand up if you've done it more than once and it was pretty much the same the second time. Yeah, 
This stuff is always the same. So what Auth0 have done is said, you know what? That stuff's always the same. Uh, so we're going to write it for you so that you don't have to write it anymore. And Auth0 is a backend that we can incorporate into our own applications that does all this user management and, and, and login and all that stuff for us. Uh, Auth0 are a small company. They're not the only ones that do this. Amazon have their own product called Amazon Cognito, and there's a few others as well. It's this whole idea of actually taking lumps of application logic that we would normally write and handing it over to somebody else to write and manage for us. Some other examples of serverless products might be a bit more familiar to you. So Amazon S3, I actually think is the original serverless service, for reasons I'll come on to in a moment. And also Amazon DynamoDB, which is Amazon's uh, key value database. Now the common theme to all of these four things I've talked about so far um, is that they are components of our applications that other people develop and operate on our behalf. So that's backend as a service. The other half of serverless is functions as a service, or FAS. Now, functions as a service is a new way of deploying server-side software oriented around deploying individual functions or operations. So when we traditionally deploy server-side software, uh, we start with a host instance. For example, a virtual machine instance or a container. We then deploy our application within the host. And this application is an operating system process and usually contains code for several different operations. Functions as a service changes this type of deployment. So what we do is we strip away the host instance and the application process from our model. And instead, we focus on just the operations or functions that express our application's logic. Instead of a host, we have the concept of a vendor FAS platform. And we deploy our functions to the FAS platform as very basic code units. Uh, we're thinking in terms of just very simple source code in zip files for JavaScript or Python, um, or simple compiled Java code in a jar file um, for JVM languages. But that's the extent of the complexity of our, of our deployment. Now, the individual functions that we've put up on the FAS platform are not constantly active in a server process, sitting idle until they need to be run. Instead, the functions as a service platform is configured for each operation to listen for a specific event. And when that event occurs, the vendor platform transparently creates an ephemeral container for our function on demand and executes our function within the container with the event. Once the function has finished executing, the functions as a service platform is free to tear down the container. Now, functions as a service depends significantly on the types of events that can trigger execution, as you would expect. But fortunately, there are many, many different types of events that we can use as sources for this, which allow us to implement many types of server-side application using this model. So just to give you some examples of the types of uh, events that we can use, and this is, this is specifically around Amazon Web Services, but other platforms have similar things. So we can use message buses, and this is, allows us to implement message event-driven systems. Uh, we can use a network file system as our source of events. And what that means is when someone uploads or changes a file in a network file system, we can use that to trigger some processing. And this allows us to, to do basic file processing, but it also allows us to implement data pipelines. We can also use time as our event. And this means that we can implement scheduled cron-like tasks using functions as a service. And finally, uh, we can use HTTP requests as our, as our event source. And this allows us to implement web apps and web API services. Now, there are many other different types of events that we can use, but obviously this gives you a flavor of the variety of different events that you can incorporate into your systems. So with functions as a service, we are abstracted from the process of actually running our code on a server. Teams are not concerned with server machines or with server processes. 
and nor are they concerned with things like operating systems. And it's this lack of concern for server machines or server processes that has led to the term serverless, even though there are servers running somewhere. Now, this is very much uh, similar to what Scott was talking about in his keynote this morning, where he was saying there is a, le there is a point in our, in our development as engineers where we know there are certain things going on under the covers, but we introduce an abstraction level and we can stop thinking about that. That's exactly what we're doing with serverless. There are still servers somewhere, but we're not thinking about them. So the most popular vendor platform for functions as a service at the moment is AWS Lambda. Um, and that was launched two and a half years ago. Who here has used it, you know, whether it's playing around or in production, who here has used AWS Lambda? Okay, a good few of you. Um, so it's, it's without doubt the most um, mature of the, of the, of the main uh, functions as a service offerings. Um, Google and Microsoft and IBM uh, all have their own versions too. Um, Google's version is in, is in beta. Microsoft's and IBM's are in production. And there are lots of open source versions of this as well. IBM's is actually an open source version, um, but there are also a bunch of independent open source projects that, that implement this. So that's serverless in a nutshell. Generic backend components as a service, on one hand, things like Google Firebase, AWS Cognito, and S3 and DynamoDB. And on the other hand, the ability to execute individual server-side functions without having to worry about the management of server processes and server machines. Now, these might seem like two completely different areas. And why am I grouping them into this one area of serverless? Well, I see that there are five common traits to all of these things, whether they're on the FAS side or the BAS side. And I'm going to talk about those right now. So first of all, no management of server hosts or server processes. Now, I mentioned this just now in regard to functions as a service, um, but this applies across the board with backend as a service as well. And this really removes a good amount of operations work from our software lifecycle. Uh, it means we don't need to worry about things like systems administration and deployment, um, and we don't need to worry about things like individual process level health checks. Uh, the second thing that we see with serverless in general is self-auto-scaling and auto-provisioning based upon load. There's actually sort of a couple of things here. So first of all, um, on, the, on the provisioning side, so typically when we think about deploying software and deploying systems, we have to think about resource allocation and resource provisioning. That is, how are we going to deploy our system? Where, are, where is our software going to run? Um, what, how many machines are we going to need to buy? Uh, what size machines are we going to need? Uh, which data center are they going to go in? Or availability zone, if we're thinking about things like AWS. And we have to constantly adjust this based upon usage, like how many machines do we need now versus three months ago? How many machines do we need right in the middle of the day versus overnight? So the good thing about serverless is we don't have to worry about this anymore. Serverless systems. So all those products that I just talked about, they auto-provision, so we don't have to tell them how many machines that we need, and they auto-scale automatically based upon load. Now, with other, other versions of, of making systems, like if we were using EC2, we may, be, we may use something like auto-scaling. So that's a very common technique with EC2. Um, auto-scaling, in that sense, needs, needs some amount of management. But with databases, it's really hard for us to auto-scale databases. That's not something that we would normally think about doing during the day. The third point, which is related to this, is that our costs are also based upon very precise usage. So let me give you an example here with AWS Lambda. So if we're deploying software in a more traditional sense using Amazon EC2, we're paying for machines by the hour. With Lambda, we're paying for usage by the 100 milliseconds. So that's 36,000 times more precise than EC2. So what that means is, if we're, doing, if we're running some software that only does things for five minutes in an hour, we're only paying for five minutes. Uh, we're not paying for a whole hour. And even for things that are you know, a little bit more continuous than that, uh, we can still typically see some cost savings here uh, if for anything other than a very uniform profile. If we have a very, very uniform profile, we're not going to see a saving here. 
but most of our applications are not uniform. There's some amount of variety, either by the hour or by the day. And we can see some interesting cost savings here when we do that. And another point to make here is that zero usage equals zero cost. So if we're not doing anything for eight hours, we're not paying anything when we're using a serverless system. Um, performance capabilities are defined in terms other than host size and count. So a serverless platform can often expose some amount of performance configuration. Um, however, this configuration is completely abstracted from the underlying host size and host count. So for, for Amazon Lambda, we can specify how much RAM we want our application to have. Um, but we don't, and, and, and things like CPU and IO scale, CPU and IO scale with the RAM that we ask for. But we're not thinking about EC2 instance sizes, and we're not thinking about how many machines that we need. Um, that is completely outsourced to AWS, and it's up to them whether they co-locate 100 Lambda functions on one big beefy machine, um, or whether they split 10 different Lambda functions across 10 machines or whatever the, what they want to do. That's completely abstracted for us. And the final point um, is we have implicit high availability, which means that we are not concerned when an individual host or an individual process fails. That is up to the platform to, uh, to, to, to deal with that, about bringing up a replacement. Now, we may have sometimes some upstream effects that we have to deal with, but it's not our responsibility to bring up uh, an alternative in its place, and we don't have to have a shadow version going on. So as an example here, when we're using Amazon S3, who here has used Amazon S3? Quite a few of you. So Amazon S3 is a big network object storage. It's one of the original AWS services. When you're using S3, you don't know whether an S3 node has, go down, has gone down ever, right? If an S3 node fails, you're, you're assuming, now don't worry, I'm getting onto a bit in a minute. <laughs> if we lose an individual node of S3, we don't know about it, right? Which just handled. Now, that doesn't mean that we're getting disaster recovery for free. So, if, for example, an entire region of S3 goes down, <laughs> now you can laugh. <laughs> if, an, if an entire region of S3 goes down, um, then we have to do something about it. And that's where we should be thinking about uh, multi-region deployment and all that kind of stuff. But the point is that there's probably individual nodes of S3 going down all the time, but we never think about it because the high availability is implicit in the service. So those are the five common traits of serverless. And we see that, we see these traits, whether it's functions as a service, so something like Amazon Lambda, or whether it's a more infrastructural thing, so something like S3 um, or Amazon Cognito. Okay, so why would we choose this way of working? Well, all of these traits that I've just been talking about really add up to three benefit areas. So first of all, serverless is often cheaper. Um, in that we, are, we have far more efficient use of resources, in that we're only paying for our software when it is doing something useful. Um, and it's also cheaper in that there's less work required for us. There's no deployment management, there's no systems administration, and auto-scaling is completely managed on our behalf. Now, what we're not saying here is that we've got rid of operations entirely. There is still a lot of operations work to do, so thinking about security and disaster recovery and all of those kind of things. But so, sort of the, the more sort of repetitive elements of, system, of, of operations, like system administration, that work goes away because we're outsourcing that to a vendor. So serverless is often cheaper. Another thing about serverless is it's sometimes often better. Um, and we can rely on experts to handle operational concerns that aren't necessarily our speciality. So one area that I like to, to, to think about this stuff is that we actually can reduce some of our risk um, profile here, especially around security. So specifically with serverless, we have fewer threat surfaces to worry about. There's, like, we don't have to worry about unpatched operating systems, um, administrator access, um, and open ports because that's all now on, on the vendor to do, and that's something that they're doing at scale. But here's the kicker. It is far, far faster to develop and deploy new applications using serverless platforms than any other type of platform that I've ever worked with. So let me read you this quote. So this is from 
from Adrian Cockcroft, who actually uh, Scott mentioned earlier in his keynote. Um, so Scott mentioned Adrian because Adrian used to be uh, the senior cloud architect at Netflix. Adrian's now at AWS. Um, and he said this uh, about six weeks or so ago in a talk. He said, we're starting to see applications be built in ridiculously short, in ridiculously short time periods. So with serverless, people are now building complete, complicated systems deployed to production that scale in 12 hours. The leverage that we get from using serverless technologies can really turn how we think about creating products up on its head. Instead of having months-long backlogs of work, we can really start to consider our products a continual series of quickly developed experiments. In other words, we can make hack days our de facto way of working. And by that, I mean having the team think about what is it that is going to make our customers awesome that we haven't been working on. Let's try that out for a couple of days and see what it works. We can actually do that with these technologies all the time. And this is what makes me really, really excited about serverless. I, I'm sometimes a little bit of a, you know, an engineering manager bean counter, and I enjoy the cost savings that this stuff brings. But the reason that I'm up here and talking, and the reason that I'm, I started the consulting business around this stuff, is because of this. The leverage that I've seen it give engineers, and, and the speed up it's given to engineers, is something that's made me really, really excited, and I think is applicable uh, across our industry. So this has been all the really bright, shiny, Sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns. Um, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be standing here if I wasn't excited about them. But I need to talk about the other side of the equation. And here be dragons. So I want to talk about a few of the limitations that you need to be aware of when you want to start using this stuff. When, not if, you want to start using this stuff. Um, so some of these uh, concerns are inherent with this approach. Um, they are always going to be there, um, and there's things that we're going to get better at dealing with or accept. Some of these concerns are because some of this stuff's really, really new. Like Amazon Lambda is a pretty new way of, de of deploying server-side software. It's only been around two and a half years, and it's the most mature of these platforms. Okay, so some of this stuff is is just hard at the moment because it's new, and a lot of that is going to get better. So I'm going to walk through a few of these concerns. So first of all, and this is sort of one of the, you know, the, almost always the first question I get asked, um, is, isn't this going to be, a, aren't we giving up a whole bunch of control to our, to our, to our vendors? Uh, and what we mean by that is, isn't this meaning that we're just completely dependent upon our vendors? And, and, and this is sort of exposed in things like, you know, we may come up against cost limits that we didn't expect, or some other kind of system limits that we didn't expect. Um, and people say, well, shouldn't we, you know, if we, if we use open source and we deploy ourselves, then we have a lot more control. And the question is, well, how much control do we really have? when we are deploying our own, our own operating systems, or deploying operating systems on our own machines. In theory, we have that control, but when was the last time, there's probably, I'm sure there's somebody in this room that has done this, but when was the last time any of us actually hacked on a Linux kernel? I know I haven't done for <laughs> years, right? And so even though we deploy an open source operating system, it doesn't really mean that we practically have any control to do anything about that when that goes wrong. And really what we're talking about here with serverless is it's, it's, it's really another step along the spectrum that we've already been doing when we've been using public cloud. Yes, we're giving up some control, but we're doing that because there's an economic choice involved. <coughs> Similarly to this is people say, isn't this just some crazy amount of vendor lock-in? Um, which is, you know, people have been worried about this, again, in, in cloud in general. So sort of, again, two answers to this. One is, when you're actually using something like Amazon Lambda, um, there's actually very, very little platform-specific code in there. You can write um, an Amazon Lambda function without re referring to any Amazon libraries whatsoever. And so that code is actually very transportable across platform. So you're actually not too locked in when it comes to the pure functions as a service code. However, 
This stuff is really pa most powerful when you're using a whole bunch of different services that the, the ecosystem provides. So when you're using something like API Gateway and DynamoDB and S3 and Amazon Kinesis. And when you're using all of these systems and you're building up a complete system, then yes, that there's going to be a significant cost to taking that solution and running it on a different cloud. And that's partly because there's going to be a lot of data in these systems that you have to move. And that's partly because these parts of, parts of these clouds are not yet utility. And by that, I mean things like file storage is pretty utility. It's the same on Amazon as it is on S3. But things like NoSQL databases and message, store and, and message buses aren't actually yet identical across the clouds. And so there is going to be an, an amount of difference um, and, and work to do if you were to need to migrate from one cloud to another. So yes, there is some vendor lock in here. But it's really what, we, again, it's, it's what we're thinking about in terms of cloud strategy anyway. And it's really not specific to serverless. But it's definitely something to be thought about. Uh, next up is tooling. And this is especially a problem with functions as a service. So functions as a service is still a fairly immature area. And its tools really do speak to that. So things like deployment and monitoring and all those kind of things um, are, are all a bit either simplistic or a little bit rough. Um, and some of the concerns, especially around distributed monitoring, we really haven't even got a good answer for yet. Now, there's some really good heroic efforts going on in the open source world around this um, that are smooth, smoothing out these edges. Um, and vendors are getting better all the time. In fact, I was just looking at my Twitter before I walked in here, and I saw that Amazon had, had announced yet more products. So <laughs> the rate of change from the vendors on this stuff um, is, is, quite, is quite amazing. Um, and so the tooling is getting better all the time. But at the moment, this is not a, this is, you know, a perfect environment. There's going to be an amount of, if you're going to use this stuff, an amount of rolling up your sleeves and being like, OK, occasionally I'm going to get bitten on this stuff. So, in other words, don't use this stuff if, if, that's, if that doesn't work in your environment. If you're OK about rolling up your sleeves a little bit, then you're good to go. Um, next up, I want to talk about testing, which is normally the second or third question I get asked on this stuff. Um, how the heck do you test all this? We're all good agile developers, right? Some of us are. Um, we all do testing all the time, right? Sometimes. So the testing story for this is, is interesting. So uh, specifically around functions as a service, unit testing is actually pretty easy for functions as a service. Because what we're typically doing is writing very, very simple individual functions. And again, as I mentioned, they have very little or no environmental dependencies that you have to use. And so you should, when you're writing things in Amazon Lambda or an equivalent, unit test the heck out of it because it's easy and, and, and you'll get a lot of coverage that way. So unit testing is good. And then we get on to integration testing or acceptance testing or functional testing or whatever you want to call it, where we're talking about testing multiple components of our system at one time. And this is where it gets really tricky. And the reason it gets tricky, excuse me, is that some of these systems don't have a version that we can run locally. Amazon do not give you a, a Amazon Lambda that I can run on my laptop. Some people have written you know, stub versions or, or, or mock versions that I can sort of test that on my laptop. But those things are not guaranteed to be the same as they are in production. Um, and even then, they might not scale in the same way or have a certain number of characteristics at the same. So it is through gritted teeth. Trust me about this. It took me a long time to come to terms with this. The, 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 my recommendation on this stuff is that we test in the cloud. Um, and that we, that we have to now, it's now 2017, we need to embrace the cloud as not just a production platform, but also as a development and testing platform. Now, the good news is that what we've been doing over the last few years is really getting, getting used to uh, automated deployment and all that stuff. And we should be using those automated deployment ideas in our development and testing. We should be using those same scripts as we do in production. And so actually, creating a test environment for this stuff in the cloud shouldn't be too tricky if we're, if we're doing all this automation correctly. And so this is my recommended approach. Yes, you can't do integration testing on a plane. I'm sorry. Um, 
but that's only, you know, you only need that 3% of the time. And if you are on a plane, that's why you have your really good unit tests. Um, one quick thing I'll add here, because we have a little more time than when I normally give this talk. If you are going to do this and you are using Amazon, do your testing in a different AWS account. The reason for that is that there are a number of limits in this stuff that are account wide. And it's very easy for you to DOS yourself uh, if you are using the same account for production and testing. One thing that's sort of, it's taken me you know, a few years of using AWS. I've always thought about an AWS account as a finance thing. It's not. It's actually an infrastructural container. It happens to have a finance thing tacked onto it, which is how much we're paying for that container. But I really recommend that when you're using this stuff, you think about an AWS account as a, as a big container and that you're deploying things into it and out of it. It's actually a lot easier to, to tear down and bring up new accounts with Amazon these days. Um, so anyway, I recommend that you do that if you're doing integration testing and you're using this stuff. Okay, I'll move on. Latency. <laughs> so again, functions as a service. Um, performance can be a problem, um, especially, especially around latency. And the reason that performance can be a problem is first of all, because we're, in, we're often introducing more network hops than we may have in our, in our more traditional system. Networks have got a lot better. And if you're a bit of a technology network nerd like I am, there was a really good talk from Amazon reInvent in November where um, they talked about how their networking has just got like nearly 100 times faster in the last sort of 10 years. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but there's still extra latency than if we had everything deployed on one machine. So that's one reason that latency is a concern. The second reason um, is cold starts. And some of you may have heard about this. So earlier on, I talked about when an event happens, the, 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 the vendor FAS platform at Lambda or whatever will bring up a container and will then invoke our code. Um, that bringing up of a container will take some time. And typically what Amazon do is once they have a container for your code, as long as you're hitting it at least every five minutes or so, they'll actually keep that container up for a few hours. And so the subsequent invocations and the subsequent events will be a lot quicker than that first one. But that first one, you will get a hit. It'll take longer for that to happen. Now, how long that is is anywhere from an extra 100 milliseconds to an extra three seconds, depending on how big various things. But there is, there is it's something definitely to be aware of when you're using this platform is cold starts, and you need to think about it. Um, and the final thing I want to sort of mention in this area is state management. So with Amazon Lambda, there is no guarantee that the next time uh, an event is executed, so maybe you've had a call in through your API gateway, there's no guarantee that your container that you're going to execute that on was the same container as that, as that got called last time. Um, and so we have to outsource uh, all of our state to a different place. In-memory state or on-process on state is not, it's not something that we can rely on in this world. Now, in some ways, this is nothing new. So some of you here will have heard of something called the 12-factor architecture, which is a, which is a sort of a, an architectural, architectural strategy that was put forward by the folks from Heroku, excuse me, nearly a decade ago. And there's, as you can imagine, 12 factors in 12-factor architecture. But one of them is don't keep any state uh, in instance. And so they talked about then about using like a, a, something like Redis or a, you know, an OSQL database or some other kind of database for all of your state. And so this is something that we've been thinking about as an industry for a while now. But the thing with Heroku is we, we could always cheat. I don't know how many, how many of you here have used Heroku? Few. So with Heroku, your dynos can be around for days, right? And, so you, and you have an amount of control over when your dynos go up or down. Not complete control, but you can, you know, there is an amount of being able to cheat. With this stuff, you can't cheat. And with this stuff, we have to think about re-architecting our system. And this really leads onto sort of my, my final point in this area, which is I said earlier, I said at the top, that serverless is an evolution of the cloud. And that is true. From an economic point of view, it is, it is definitely where we've come to over the last 10 years with all those other technologies that I've talked about. But it comes with a jolt. So when we had things like infrastructure as a service, um, which used virtualization, and then we had containers as a service, 
we really were thinking about our architecture in the same kind of way. We were just putting different kinds of boxes around the same code, right? Yeah, we horizontally scaled a bit more easily. That was good. But really, we were still thinking about long-lived processes. And this stuff, we can't think about that stuff. And we can't think about architecture in that way anymore. It just doesn't work, partly because of these short-lived instances and this inherently event-driven way of working, but also because we're literally outsourcing pieces of our code that we would normally write to other providers. And so serverless is an evolution economically but it comes with a jolt architecturally. And this is one area where, as a sort of a, as a serverless world, we're still thinking about, okay, so what does good architecture look like? Okay, I wanna talk about some use cases now. So first of all, excellent ways of using serverless technology. So latency tolerant asynchronous applications. And by that, I mean, Things like data pipelines, where you are getting a whole bunch of data come in, and you need to process that data asynchronously. This stuff is amazing for this. We use this technology at my old company to handle uh, a whole data pipeline. I worked at an ad tech company. And at the top of, our, top of our data pipeline, we got about 300 million events a day. And then we went through a data pipeline and doing various massaging and saving and updating databases. And this stuff was so good for that kind of environment. It just solved a whole bunch of headaches, it was way cheaper, and it gave us the opportunity to, to try out new things in a way that we hadn't done before. So for that kind of sort of asynchronous application where you have some amount of latency tolerance, you know, a few hundred milliseconds or more, this is brilliant. But it's also useful for many situations where it's a synchronous application, but latency tolerant. So the example I would like to give here is there is a, is a company right here in Philadelphia called Bustle. Uh, they're, a, they're a website, um, and they are an entirely serverless site. So they are, serving, they are rendering pages to customers, but they're using Lambda for all of their rendering. Um, and that's because what they've decided is, well, you know what? Our latency constraints are sub 200 milliseconds, four nines of the time. And sub 200 milliseconds, four nines of the time, this stuff can do. So. For latency tolerant applications, which even if they're synchronous, this stuff is still good. And finally, glue. So this is sort of where people tend to start using this stuff first, is using it for little bits of infrastructure. And that might be things like monitoring tools, or it might be part of our actual deployment process. So some of you here will have heard of CloudFormation, which is Amazon's sort of recommended deployment technology. Um, and you can actually embed Lambda functions within your CloudFormation deployment flow. Um, so this, this, this idea of using tiny little bits of serverless technology sort of to glue various pieces of, of the rest of your system together um, is also a great way of using serverless tech. So there are some areas, though, that I wouldn't necessarily use serverless right now, just sort of give you a balance. So I used to work in the trading industry, the financial trading industry, for about 10 years. Um, and a bunch of that time, I was working on front office, high frequency trading apps, low latency trading apps. And for that stuff, a lot of what I needed, a uh, lot of what I was working on, the, 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 the latency constraints were sub 10 milliseconds pretty much all of the time. I wouldn't use Lambda for this. Um, and I wouldn't recommend using Lambda for this. Uh, but the thing is that most systems don't have these latency constraints. Some do, and if they do, you probably don't want to use it. But if they don't, you know, think pretty hard about whether you actually have loose enough latency constraints that you can use this stuff. Another example that I wouldn't use this for is large-scale stateful stuff. So if I'm deduping hundreds of gigabytes of data and need a whole bunch of RAM and need like 10 minutes of processing time, I'm not going to use this stuff. With Lambda, you are limited to one and a half gigabytes of memory, and you are limited to five minutes of runtime. Um, after five minutes, your process is chopped off. And the final thing is long-running stateful systems. So if I'm doing something where I'm interacting with a number of external APIs, for example, um, and I'm making calls to them, and they're going to take a little while to come back, and I want to collect those things all together, um, and I want to do that in a sort of a in-memory transaction-ish logical thing, I, I wouldn't use Lambda for that kind, of, uh, that, that kind of requirement. But that sort of leads on to my final point in this, which is 
it's perfectly reasonable to embrace a hybrid architecture here. Now, I'm talking about a hybrid architecture of serverless and server-full architecture. I'm not talking about hybrid cloud. It's an entirely different thing. So what I mean by embracing the hybrid is it's perfectly OK to use different styles of technology. So you might have a long-lived process that you want to run in a, in a regular EC2 instance or something like that. And then that itself can call out to various different serverless technologies. And you might also have something in the reverse, where you may have a, a Lambda function responding to an HTTP request that you want to uh, invoke a, a non-serverless database. You might want to call a traditional um, SQL database. And this is all a perfectly reasonable architecture to do. The one thing I want to, be, I want to mention, if you're doing this, though, is to be careful about mixing components with different scaling properties. So to give you an example, that, that one I just gave of saying, say you're using Lambda behind an API gateway. The really nice thing about Lambda is it will auto scale 100 wide without you even doing any work, which is awesome, right? That might be less awesome if all of those 100 concurrent Lambdas are making 10 requests per transaction to a central SQL database, right? So <laughs> in that situation, you may need to think about, hmm, what am I gonna do here? Do I, do I introduce a, a separate component that's going to funnel those requests through it? Do I actually say, you know what, those Lambda functions, the part of data that they need, we're going to shift that out of the SQL database and then we're going to put that in something like DynamoDB? Um, there are various sort of techniques to approaching that. But you need to be aware when you're mixing up these different sort of scaling uh, types um, about what's going on and, and what could happen as your system scales up. OK. I'm going to close out with talking a little bit about the future. So what is going to happen with serverless? It's, as I said, it's still really new. Um, most of you are here because you probably heard a little bit about it but didn't really know what it was. And that's because it's so new. So what's going to happen over the next you know, year or so? So first of all, the tooling, as I mentioned, that can be a little bit rough around the edges is going to get a lot, lot better. And as I mentioned, Amazon just said, announced something this afternoon where their distributed monitoring tool um, that they've just started working on this thing called X-Ray now works with Lambda, and that's great, and that's another step along improving this whole tooling world. Um, and also, there's you know various things here around deployment. Um, you know, various schools of thought around how what's the best way to deploy these systems. No one yet really knows what the best way is. Several people have ways that have worked for them, but we're going to start seeing some more commonality on that stuff over the next year or so. One of the things I mentioned is that this changes how we think about architecture, and it changes it fit pretty fundamentally. Um, so what is good architecture for this? We don't know yet. If someone were to come, uh, uh, come, come to you and say, hey, I've got a book on best practices for serverless architecture, look at them with very strangely and walk away, because they don't know. We don't know what best practices are for this stuff at all. I'm a little bit reticent about using the phrase best practices ever, but we certainly don't know what best practices for this stuff are yet. In two or three years' time, we're going to be, someone is going to go and write the, 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 the serverless architecture patterns book, and that will be the right time to write it. But we don't know yet what is good for this. We're still sort of trying out various different things. There's some great case studies out there, and I definitely recommend going and reading them. But they're highly context specific, and we haven't really figured out what are the more generalizable patterns that we can use around this stuff yet. But it will come. And finally, our organizations are going to change. So I said you know, earlier on in this that one of the benefits to this stuff is this really rapid acceleration of how we can build products. Um, and I talked about how we can make Hack Day every day. And that's great. We now have a technology platform that will support you know, these really, really rapid experiments, experiments. But having a technology platform is only one piece of the puzzle for that. We also need our organizations to be able to support that. So we need things like true DevOps. And what I mean by that is developers and operations folk actually working together without any significant barriers between them. We need to think about how do we handle policy management. Security becomes a concern here. How do we, you know, how do we uh, control access to data? How do we do cost management in this, system, in this system where any team can just bring up a whole stack of new pieces of software? How do we do that in a way that's safe to our CFO? <laughs> um, and how do we do product management now? 
if, if what we're saying is that we want our, all of our teams to be constantly thinking about ways of making our customers awesome, then that means that product ownership is no longer just you know, some central office somewhere or just the product managers. It means that everyone can now be involved in product management. Not everyone has to be, but everyone can be. And so how do we, as more management folks, how do we enable that within our organizations? And so I think that this is a great technology lever, but our organizations are really going to have to change to, to make the most of them in some of these ways that I've talked about. But anyway, to close out, I want to set you a challenge. Let other people do your repetitive work for you. Don't pay for your servers to twiddle their thumbs. And make every day a hack day. And thank you very much. Um, so we got about eight minutes or so. Um, so first of all, there's a, there's a big URL up the top there. Um, that's a link to a Google Doc that has these slides and it has a bunch of other resources there that you might find useful if you're interested in this. Um, my Twitter handle's on there, my, my company website's there. We, so we started at the beginning of the year and our entire mission is to help um, our clients and the industry um, learn how to be more awesome using this technology. And so if you're interested in this stuff and, 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 and want to chat, I'll be here until you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock. Um, but otherwise, uh, definitely uh, feel free to reach out to me. All right, I've got a question at the back. Uh, oh, first one there, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Um, I, I definitely agree that it's the next generation of um, where we're going with cloud. It makes a lot of sense. The thing that, um, so I I've been working in healthcare for much of my career. And so uh, two things have been really, I've been really struggling with, and we've been, we do Amazon, and we do Lambda and Azure, and we do containers and everything else. There's two things that I've been really struggling with, one of which is, how to think about the pricing for uh, calling a function. So it's really easy for me to have a conversation with somebody and say, I kind of have a good feel for how much a server should cost if I, or a VM. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a good feel for, oh, if I'm going to pay for a VM for an hour, here's how much I should pay and here's how much a server should cost. Then you get, the thing I've been sort of struggling with is then you get into, well, how much should I pay for somebody to call this little chunk of code, and, which is a little weird. So I was wanted to get any thoughts you had on, on, on that end. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, we do have a lot of software that we can't run, or, or we, can't, we can run in the public cloud, but we also have to run in our own private data center or sometimes in the customer's data center. And so uh, you hadn't mentioned um, any of these other things like iron.io or something like that. So I was curious about what your thoughts were on these um, sort of uh, non-public cloud vendor specific uh, uh, serverless uh, platforms that are, that are starting to show up. Yep. Um, I'm going to answer that second one first because it's easier. <laughs> um, I, I did briefly mention there are a whole number of open source implementations of functions as a service out there. Iron, Iron, IO is, Iron Functions is one. Uh, Galactic Fog is another. Fission is another. IBM's own implementation is, is yet another. Um, and, and there's a lot of activity going on here. I wouldn't want to bet the farm on any one of these right now. But on the other hand, uh, you know, betting the farm might not be really betting the farm. It might only be betting the, chi the chicken coop. Um, and so I, I, to, if, if, if you have an environment where you need to, you need to run a certain amount on-prem, um, or, or you want to run in a, um, in a cloud agnostic way, I would try one of these things out and use it. Um, I was chatting to some folks to one of these. Um, products the other day, and they really opened my eyes. And I was like, OK, I haven't really been thinking about this open source part as much as I want to, and I'm going to think about it more. I think what we're going to see um, is we're going to see the cloud foundry of FAS appear. So if we go back eight years, maybe six years, there were definitely a few different open source projects trying to implement platform as a service. Now there's cloud foundry. That's it, right? <laughs> you, want to use an open, you, you want an open source PaaS, you use cloud foundry. And I think that's probably going to happen um, in two, three years' time on this. I expect it will be one that very tightly integrates with Kubernetes. Um, that's where I, what I would do right now if I was going to do this stuff. But again, these things tend to be relatively low impact. In each of these things has a relatively low impact from a code point of view on what you're developing. So it's, it's not too much of a problem. Um, first question, just quickly remind me again. Oh, pricing. Yeah. How do, you, how do you figure out pricing for this? Hmm. Um, 
That's a good question. I haven't, I haven't been asked that one before. I think that I don't have a quick answer. One thing I would say that immediately comes to mind is a lot of the value from an API that you provide isn't necessarily from the technical infrastructure that is used to provide it, but is, is a, I would argue that probably the majority of the value is actually from the amount of intellectual time that went into creating it. Um, so I don't know how you would think about initially pricing it. One thing I would say on this stuff is it's really easy to know how individual parts of your application now cost in a way that we never knew before. So, so, so my question was flipped around. How do I know what's the right price I should pay Amazon? Oh. Like what's, what's a fair price for me to call this function? Well, what's the fair price for you to pay Amazon for it? Um, well, you. <laughs> You pay, Amazon sort of don't have a reserved instance for this stuff, so you pay what you, they, they charge you. Uh, the one thing that you can do with this stuff is um, you can vary how much you pay by saying how much RAM you want, and so it will scale. So if you say you want 128 megs of RAM, and then you switch that saying, actually, I want one and a half gigs of RAM, you're going to be paying 10 times the price for it. But on the other hand, in theory, if your code is totally CPU bound, and you're then you're only taking 10% of the time to uh, to run it, then your costs may come down if your if your application is running suitably fast. Um, yeah, it's a tricky question. I'm happy to chat about that afterwards. Uh, there was definitely one at the back. I have a confession to make. I like SQL. <laughs> yep. The, these databases, the serverless databases, have have seemed pretty limited. Is there any? Uh, potential for getting more advanced query features or things like that, a more SQL-ish kind of serverless database? Um, there's definitely a place, I think, for SQL, right? It depends on what you're doing. Um, I think, you know, in, in several points in my career, I've been like, wait a minute, we're using one database for four different types of activity. Maybe we should be using different types of database. And, and the most obvious example there is like using a different analytics database to, a, to your operational database. Um, so I think that using a SQL database is perfectly fine. Um, on the other hand, you know, plenty of companies have had a heck of a lot of success using NoSQL databases for specific types of problem. Um, and so I think it depends on what, what you're trying to do. And I would say don't, you know, look at the places where people have had success with NoSQL, and if any of those match what you're trying to do, then maybe try and follow them. Um, but the other thing with NoSQL databases is they're constantly improving, but they're also limited by what they are. There's no question that you're never going to have really, you know, the complete set of um, functionality that you get with SQL um, from a NoSQL database. So I'd say use a, use a SQL database where it works for you, but also, you know, using different tools is, is what we're great at as engineers and try and figure out the right tool for the right place. Uh, how do you deal with, like, uh, configuration? in some of these uh, serverless applications. Like, I'm mainly thinking about like, like uh, sensitive configuration. Mm -hmm. yep. You might want to decrypt it or yep. whatever, whenever you run. So the question is, how do you, how do you deal with sensitive configuration with this stuff? Um, there's actually a really good story around that now, uh, which changed three months ago. So <laughs> with using Amazon Lambda back in uh, like August time, I would say, mm, that's kind of tricky, and you have to hand roll it. Um, Amazon introduced environment variables to Lambda in October. And one of the things that they give you out of the box is integration with KMS, which is their key management store. And so you can actually say, in your Lambda function, you can just say, hey, refer to this environment variable, which comes from my encrypted store, and Amazon just do all the work for you. It's pretty cool. And suddenly, it went, it went from being like a real headache to just in a day, Amazon went, oh, we've solved that problem for you. It's like, oh, thanks, Amazon. <laughs> Yay. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, I'll be outside afterwards, so if anyone wants to chat, I'll be outside. Thank you very much for coming.